You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry Church, welcome to worship this morning. I'm Eric Folkers. This is a good friend of mine, Eric Scrotenborg. He's teaching with us today. And um, we're thrilled to have Eric here. He's unpacking our second teaching out of the Gospel of Luke. And um, as we get going, I'm just excited you wore a cardigan. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's got a Mr. Rogers feel. So today we're yeah. in Mr. Scrotenborg's neighborhood. I invite you to sit back, open your hearts and minds to what God wants to say through his word. Yeah. Thanks for being here, brother. <laughs> it's cold outside. That's why I have my car to get on. No, it's truly an honor um, to be with you this morning, to open our scriptures, to let God's word speak, and to dig in as a community. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, This morning, we come into your presence as a community, and we open your text. And you tell us that your text, your word is alive, and that it teaches. And so, Lord, we come this morning, and and we desire that your word transform us. So we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to take these words off of the page and bring them into our hearts. Lord, give us eyes to see what you want us to see this morning, give us ears to hear what you want us to hear, and give us feet for the path that you will call us to walk as you send us out of here. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning we get to continue to walk in the footsteps of Jesus through the eyes of Luke. Now, Luke is one of the writers of the story of Jesus. Now we have four accounts of Jesus' life in our Bibles, right? We have Matthew wrote one, Mark wrote one, Luke wrote one, and John wrote one. And these are all biographies of Jesus through the perspective of the author. Now scholars think that Mark wrote his gospel first. And we have to realize and we have to understand that Mark wrote his gospel about 30 years, probably, 30 years after Jesus died and arose. Now that's interesting because Paul has already been on his missionary journeys. And so the world has started to hear and and churches have started to be formed around the good news of what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. But then you have Luke, and he decides, I am going to write about the life of Jesus. And he writes with a very specific purpose in mind. Now we have to remember, Luke actually writes his gospel, and then he gives us the sequel to his gospel. We call it the book of Acts. And so Luke writes his gospel, his story of Jesus, and and scholars think that he may have had a copy of Mark that he was using, and maybe another text. But we also know that Luke was traveling with some some people, and he was friends with some people who actually saw the events of Jesus' life. And he learned from those that knew Jesus and the things that happened happened. But Luke writes with a very specific purpose in mind. We get an idea of what that purpose is when we look at the second book he wrote, the book of Acts. Let me show you this. In Acts 1, 8, he records Jesus saying this to the disciples. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now what Jesus was saying was, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to tell the world and show the world about who I am in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the end of the world. And for them, that meant Rome. And so that's exactly how Luke tells this story. He talks about the early church in Jerusalem, and then he talks about how the gospel spread from Jerusalem to Judea, to the neighborhoods around Jerusalem, and then all the way to Rome. He ends the book of Luke with Paul in front of Caesar himself. So what's interesting is when we 
read Luke's gospel, what Luke does is in the first three chapters, he actually speaks about the Roman Empire. He, he puts his whole gospel in the background of the Roman Empire. He says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, in the days of Tiberius, Caesar, Tiberius. And so he puts his whole gospel, he starts it in the empire, in Rome, and we see him record Jesus' life and, and the teachings and, and the things Jesus does, and it brings us to a point in Jerusalem. So we have Luke in his gospel starting here, going here, and recording the death and resurrection of Jesus, and then the good news spreading out into the world. Now, why would he do that? We get a hint as to why he would do that in the way he starts his gospel. It says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So many people had written a narrative about Jesus. He says, It's just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. So he's saying, I didn't see what happened, but I gathered these accounts from those who did. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. And then Luke does this. He addresses this gospel and his writings. He says, to the most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So he addresses this book to Theophilus. Now that is a very Greek way to write. Theophilus just means lover of God, but it was probably someone, probably a believer who had just come to believe in this Jesus after hearing the story of Jesus. And Luke says, I just want to assure you, so I'm going to write what I've seen and, and what I've heard. So what audience is Luke writing to? The most excellent Theophilus. It's very Greek. Well, we know that Luke is a Gentile. And as you read Luke's account in Acts, we read that Luke was a traveling partner of Paul. And we read that Luke was Paul's doctor. And probably what happened was Paul would tell Luke these stories and Luke would start to record them. Here's a map. We think Luke probably joined Paul in Philippi, which is in Greece. It's in Macedonia. And that he wrote this book for the Greeks in Macedonia, for the Gentiles. Now, these are people who didn't know this story. These are, these are people who were just learning about Jesus for the first time. And Luke does some amazing things in his gospel. In Luke 22, 1, he's writing and he's telling a story about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but he does this. It's interesting. He says, now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, and then he says this, which is called Passover. He has to explain to his audience what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. This is all new to them. In Luke 11, it's fascinating because he, he's talking, um, he's, he's retelling this story and he uses the words, woe to you, lawyers. Well, Matthew says this, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. So once again, Luke changes his words in order to, to, be, to talk to his audience, to, to use words that his audience would know. Last week, Pastor Eric talked about the story where the friends took their friend who couldn't walk and they lured him through the roof. But this is how Luke writes it. He says, They went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles of the roof. Well, in the land of the Bible, in Israel, where this story would have taken place, the roofs are made of wood and mud. 
They're not tiles. But do you see what Luke does? And this is what's amazing to me. Luke says, I need to tell this story, but I need to tell it in a way that you are going to understand. And so Luke has the job of writing, narrating the story of Jesus to an audience who has never heard about Jesus. It's his job to to write, to show them what Jesus taught, but not only what Jesus taught, but what Jesus was like and what Jesus did. And friends, I think this is so powerful because this is exactly what God calls us to do. You see, God gives you a context. And in many of your contexts, whether that's school, whether that's work, whatever it might be, there are people who have never heard about Jesus. And it's our job to get Jesus in front of them, to tell them about Jesus, to show them who Jesus was and what he was like. And so I love that we're walking through this book of Luke. And I hope we find some encouragement because the question is, how are we supposed to do that? How are we supposed to tell a world that's never heard about Jesus what Jesus is like and who he is? Well, Luke helps us in his gospel. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 6. Last week, Pastor Eric took us through Luke 5. And as Pastor Eric said, it's as if Jesus burst on the scene. You spent some time over Christmas looking at the narratives, the, the, the birth of Jesus, and now it's time for Jesus to come and do his ministry. He's 30 years old and he steps onto the scene. And Eric likened this to Justin Bieber. And he said, he came on the scene and everyone wanted to see him. Everybody wanted to, everybody wanted to meet him because he was doing some amazing things. He was teaching new things. He was, he was um, breaking the molds. He was healing. And so people from all over came to see and to hear Jesus. And this continues in chapter 6. Jesus is breaking the mold of what the people thought religion was all about. You see, Jesus came and he says, I want to show you something different. You have made religion about following a bunch of laws. And so Jesus comes on the scene. And last week we saw that he healed this man. And the Pharisees, the church leaders were like, you can't do that. You can't heal. You can't forgive sins. He also forgave his sins. And they said, you can't do that. And Jesus says, well, I can also heal him, and he did it. And this week, we get two stories at the very beginning of chapter 6, in which Jesus is walking with his disciples on the Sabbath, and they start to eat, and they, they, they work. That's kind of, they, the Pharisees, the church leaders, are defining this as, as work. And then the next story is, on the Sabbath again, Jesus heals and that would be considered work. And to the Pharisees, they said, wait a second, we have a law here that says, on the Sabbath, keep it holy. So there's no work on the Sabbath. But then Jesus comes on the scene and says, you've got this wrong. You see, not all commandments are created equal. And you're upholding this command where you can't work on the Sabbath, but you're forgetting about the commandment of love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus says, if I can help someone on the Sabbath, I'm going to. If I can heal on the Sabbath, I'm going to. We start to see 
what commands Jesus puts as the most important. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So we have these two stories, and then we get this amazing, this amazing narrative of what I think is Jesus' secret sauce in his ministry. It's Jesus' solution to how the world is supposed to know the good news. It says this in chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples, and he chose from them the twelve whom he named apostles. And then he goes on, goes on to tell you the names of these apostles. And, and this is a, a group of, of boys, I think, around the ages of 16, maybe 15 or 16. And Jesus says, I am going to call these, these boys to come around me and to follow me and to be my disciples. And what's amazing is it's a, quite a ragamuffin group of boys. You see, one of them is Matthew. He's a tax collector. He collects tax, taxes for the Romans. And then you have Simon, who is called the Zealot. Now, the Zealots were a group of people who hated the Romans. And they felt like they could use violence against anything Roman. So here in, in Jesus' group of disciples that he calls to him, you have a tax collector who collects taxes for the Romans, and then you have someone who hates the Romans, and Jesus asks them to get along. So Jesus surrounds himself with his disciples. And we learn in chapter 5 that he calls those disciples. He says to them, follow me. There's nothing that they did to earn this. We have to remember that. Jesus comes and he says, follow me. I think you can be like me. And they drop everything and they follow him. Now what's cool is this is the exact same thing God does with each one of us. Jesus says, follow me. There's nothing you can do to deserve this. Jesus says, I want you to follow me. And because of the blood he shed on the cross, and because he arose from the dead, following him means that we will have life and that we will live with him in eternity. But there's nothing we did to earn that. That's a free gift. That's what we call grace. Jesus says, follow me. And when we decide to say yes to that, then Jesus says, now we start the adventure. We start the journey. This is just the beginning because God invites us to go and to be on mission with him after we decide to follow him. And we do this in response to the gift. Not because we have to, to earn anything, but we do this in response to the gift that he has given us. And so what's next, right? What's next for these disciples? Well, these disciples start to follow Jesus. And we get in our text, in chapter 6, starting in verse 20, we get this group of teachings that Jesus teaches to the disciples. He says, this is what I want for you. This is how I want you to live. Now we know these teachings as the Sermon on the Mount. And whether these teachings were one block of teaching or a bunch of teachings that our biblical writers put together, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. 
But we have this group of teaching and Jesus says, this is how I want you to live. Now we get some insight in Matthew's version of this teaching. Jesus says this in Matthew's version of it. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. You see, I don't think Jesus teaches much new things, many new things. You see, I think what he teaches is he's teaching about what they already know, what God has already asked them to do. And Jesus says, I have not come to abolish this, to teach you something totally new, but I have come to fulfill this text and what God has been calling you to live. And what that means, when Jesus says, I have come to fulfill this, he's saying, I have come to show you how to live out the text. How to live out God's word. And so he teaches them. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Love your enemies. Do good. Lend to people. Expect nothing in return and your reward will be great. Be merciful. Even as your Father is merciful, do not judge. Forgive. Give. Then he tells this story. This is Luke 6. Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately fell and the ruin of that house was great. Now, this is a powerful story because Jesus had just taught them a bunch of things. But then he uses this picture of the wise and the foolish builder to kind of put an exclamation point on his teaching. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Matthew will tell this same story. But Matthew will use different details. Now, this makes sense because Matthew's audience was different. Matthew's audience were, was Jewish people who would have known about the land of the Bible. And they would have known the pictures. And so Matthew uses the picture of the wise man building his house on the rock, but the foolish man building his house on the sand. Let me show you what that looks like for Matthew. This is a picture of a wadi. It's a, it's a mountain A wadi is where two mountains meet. And it's the valley that runs between them. And you can see that there's rock, cliffs on one side, but then in the valley there's sand. And for those of you who are builders, you know that sand is a great foundation. So why would that be the picture? Well, it's the picture here because in the spring, the waters come down. When it rains, the waters come down the rock. And they move into the canyon and flash floods happen at a moment's notice. And everything in the way gets washed out. And that's the picture Matthew is using. He's saying a foolish person would build his house on the sand, but a wise person would build his house on the rock. Because when the flash floods come, they don't have to worry. But Luke, because Luke's audience is different, uses this picture. 
This is a Greek villa. And he says, a wise man builds his house using a foundation. But a foolish man doesn't use a foundation. So when the floods come, it takes the house away. But don't let these pictures get us off track. Because what Luke is saying is he's saying, if you're wise, you will take these words in this book. And you will not only hear them, but you will do them. You see, Jesus is calling us to radical obedience. He says, I want you to do this. And he says, I have come to fulfill this text, which means I have come to show you how to live out these words. Friends, in the ancient day, what it meant to be a disciple was it meant that you followed your teacher and you did what your teacher did and you learned what he would do in any situation. And so the, these disciples that followed Jesus, they would watch him. They would see how he loved. They would see how he served. They would see how he gave. They would see how he reacted when, when a person was dropped through the ceiling and laid at his feet. And they would do what he did. And that is the call that Jesus puts on our life as well. That's his plan. To show the world what he's like. He says, I want you to be like me and then go live in the world. That's radical obedience. Be like me. Have you ever thought about that? You are God's plan to show the world what he's like. So be like Jesus. But there's something else. How do you become like Jesus if you don't spend time with him? Check out what Luke writes. Luke 6, 40 says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. You see, those disciples walked in the footsteps of Jesus and they became like him. But in order to do that, they needed to spend time with him and they needed to learn who he was and what he was. And what he would do so that they could do it themselves. And they needed to spend time with him in order to do that. And so do we. Not only does Jesus call us to radical obedience, but he calls us to practice proximity. In order to know what Jesus is like, we have to spend time with him. And you know how we do that? We read this. We must know what Jesus is like in order to represent him well to the world. But then Jesus will say to his disciples, now it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go out into the world. It's time for you to practice proximity with others. And so go, be in the world, but not of the world. You see, these go together. Radical obedience and practicing proximity. There's no way you can practice proximity without radical obedience. Jesus finds himself with the, 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 the parts of society that the church says you can't be, you can't hang out with. But I think... Jesus gives us permission to hang out with those people who the church says, you know what, you can't, you can't be with. But friends, if we do that, we need to make sure that we practice radical obedience. Because the ways of the world are attractive. But this is the tension that God has called his people to, li to live in for, for all of time. You see, they have to be 
in the world, but not of the world. They have to show the world what God is like, but they have to show them an accurate picture of what God is like. But there's no way that the world is going to see it if we don't practice proximity. So, friends, here's a couple things I want you to think about this week. Number one, is there something in your life that you need to change in order to be more like Jesus? Is there one thing that you think, ah, yeah, there's part of my life that I need, I need to change, that I need to adjust in order so that my life reflects more like what Jesus' life looked like? And then my next question is, is there someone that you have to move into proximity with in order to show them what Jesus is like? You see, Paul says this. Paul says, look at my life, and then you'll see what Jesus is like. Can you say that? Friends, I don't know what this looks like for you, but let me tell you this one thing. The most important discipleship relationship you have is with your kids, if you have children. So what does that look like? They're looking to you to see what Jesus is like. When you come home at night from work, if you work during the day or in the evening, and you get to spend time with your kids, are you really spending time with your kids? They need to live with you in proximity in order to see what Jesus is like. And friends, this may mean that at work you need to have lunch or dinner with a different crowd. Or if you're a student, you may need to go and you may need to interact with people who you're uncomfortable with but who need to see Jesus. Who do you have to move into proximity with in order so that they can see what Jesus is like? Friends, God has a plan to speak to the world who doesn't know anything about Jesus. You're his plan. You're his message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you that when we open your word, it speaks. But Lord, sometimes it convicts. And hopefully it transforms and helps us to look at things a little bit differently. And so Lord, help us to see in our life where we might have to make a few adjustments so that we more accurately reflect Jesus. And then, Lord, give us the courage to go to the places that need to hear about who Jesus is and to see what he is like. Help us not just to hear the words in this book, but help us to do them through radical obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.